Hello and welcome to this video on pheromones. This is a word that gets thrown around every now and then. It can be in a very specific context like bee signaling, or it can be about sex territory and more. Sometimes it is used well, and other times it would be reasonable to mistake it for thinking the textbooks should be rewritten, if the people who said that are right. You can summarily describe pheromones as a chemical that is secreted into the environment, and that triggers a response from the same species. It is often an airborne signal, but it's also in water and solid material like soil. The signals diffuse out and signals to all the recipients of the same species to react in a particular way. The pheromones in most species are released and in some ways behave very much like hormones. That is, they come out of glands that are either in or on the body of a given species. For bees, this would be the Nasonov gland. It's then picked up by a appropriate receptor which sends a signal to the brain and from here it generates a particular series of events. In the case of bees, they secrete this from their hormone and as the gland secretes the hormone, the bee fans its wings and the pheromone is released into the air. If this is the front of a beehive, it sends a signal saying this is home. If it's in response to a threat, it says this is a threat increase aggression. If we're talking about bees returning to a hive, they pass through the pheromone and it binds to its receptor. Although it is notable that not all species will have the same type of receptors or the same receptors at all. With this in mind, there are two broad classifications, TAAR and vulnerable receptors. TAAR, or trace amine-associated receptors, are found in the olfactory epithelium and bulb. This is effectively your nose, or the other creature equivalent. Reptiles, amphibia like frogs, a number of different mammals, have a different version. This is also found in the olfactory bulb, but it's called the vomerensal organ sometimes also called Jacobson's organ, depending on the age of your textbook. This sits at the bottom of the nasal septum, somewhere between the mouth and the nose. When this is triggered, it's either from air coming in through the mouth or the nose, and it begins sending a signal to the brain, just the same way as scent, when you breathe it in, can trigger certain memories and similar. There are three kinds of pheromones that are going to be important to think about. Release the pheromones, and these will alter the behavior of the recipient. For example, these are the sorts of pheromones bees will put out of their hive to try and draw in members to let them know that that's where they are, or to bring in mates when trying to reproduce. Primer pheromones, which create differences in developmental stages. For example, if you're trying to trigger certain adaptations needed as a creature gets older. Finally, there are signal pheromones. These are the shortest acting in terms of what happens, but what they do is a far more aggressive change. For example, one reason why you should never kill a wasp by squishing it is that when you do that, it releases the pheromone saying it's been harmed. This draws other wasps into it. By allowing it to die somewhat slowly, you are in fact creating a situation in which you have the release of a signal pheromone, leading to greater aggression, a short-term change, but one that you're likely to regret very quickly. In terms of what animals will do in response to these pheromones, there are a few general categories. The first being aggregation pheromones. These can help in reproduction by trying to draw in mates. These can also help by increasing the number of the organism in a given area, often to try and push away or repel an attack by an aggressor. Bees do this to hornets in Japan. There's similar purposes amongst trail pheromones. Ant trails are the best example of this. 
you'll find that ants follow a very specific path when they're going to and from food. The ants generate this trail of pheromones, and the trail gets stronger the longer and more that trail is used. This means the bigger the food, the stronger the trail is. Ants will follow this to get to the food and follow it back in order to return the food. Sex pheromones are another one, and this one is theoretically relevant to humans, although we'll touch on that shortly. The big indicator here is that, generally speaking, females indicate the availability of breeding by sending out a pheromone. Males may also do this to indicate that they are able to reproduce at that point. Cats in heat are a common example. There are some hormones, largely from mammals, that are produced to try and appease another member of the same species, although these aren't common in humans. There are some pheromones that are produced, and these cause a near instant change in certain behaviours. For instance, amongst rabbits, the suckling motion, a mechanical muscle-derived motion, can be stimulated by pheromones. This helps to encourage a newborn rabbit to suckle, thereby allowing it to start feeding that much earlier. There is some controversy around the role that pheromones have in humans. The problem with this is that there's not much, if any, high quality, reproducible evidence that humans produce pheromones that have an effect on other humans. This is made more difficult by the nature of what a pheromone is and how do you isolate it so that it is the only cue that initiates some sort of response. Most humans, when producing a pheromone, tend to make something that's much more mixed and complicated. It's not just a single pheromone trying to derive a given result. For this reason, although it's theoretically possible, and we do have the physical necessary features to be able to use pheromones, it's not necessarily true that we make pheromones that have a strong enough stimulus effect on the human to then have an outcome with our behaviours. Pheromones are a weird thing, but in many terms, it makes a great deal of sense. In many species, a control and communication mechanism that is not vocal is necessary. Small creatures like insects lack a vocal centre in their brain. There's no room for the complexity of muscle, auditory and cognitive systems needed. Pheromones mitigate this problem. It acts as a direct, complex message with a very narrow role, but lack of a specific target. It can indicate reproduction readiness, territory, and food. All of this without the complicated discussion that occurs when asking someone what they want to eat. If you're talking about a large colony of bees or ants, trying to transmit a message across the entire colony or nest, it would not be feasible. A pheromone does the same thing, but without the need to ensure you get to every single individual and pass on the message. At the same time, if you're not selective in mates, this is another way to indicate readiness for reproduction. Something particularly useful in animals, where the more offspring there are, the greater the theoretical capacity that that species will continue to survive. This is, of course, speaking about it in terms of animals and cognitive function. Pheromones, as mentioned, aren't limited to just the air and water. Plants can also produce pheromones, and although we haven't touched on them in any detail in this video, it's another area that needs to be considered when thinking about the role of pheromones and how they can communicate things like threat. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.